Good evening, Carolina. I'm Sam Kander. And I'm Tyler Peroni. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Carolina Late Show. And that means another night of laughs and fun for our wonderful audience. Yes, it absolutely does, Sam. Get ready for the greatest show to ever air in this studio tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed a witty intro that we actually did have time to write this week. That said, welcome to our first segment of the show. JP says things? I hope he does. So now let's please join me and welcome our special guest, John Patrick Bittenberry. John Patrick Berry! John Patrick Berry! Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, so glad to have you with us, JP. What are you? You came equipped. Oh, yeah. What are you going to be uh, talking about this evening? Because I sure have no idea. What's with the regalia? What's with I'm so happy to join you guys here today to talk about something very near and dear to my heart, the warriors of Sparta. <laughs> you know, long ago, back in the great days of the Greek city-states, they were divided. There was no Greek nation. There was Athens, and there was Sparta, the two great city-states. And when the Persian Empire threatened the entire Greek peninsula, they came together, led by Leonidas and his army of 300 Spartan warriors. And guess what they did? What did they do? They, they all died. <laughs> and you know, their namesakes would not be forgotten, as in 2001, the video game company known as Bungie Studios created a game known as Halo Combat Evolved, where you, the player, played as a Spartan. Okay. okay. Now, it's not exactly unknown if you are Leonidas. It is known, actually, <laughs> that you are not Leonidas. You are John 117, the Master Chief. Okay. Uh, the Spartan program was actually started long ago before the humans in get entered their engagement with the Covenant. Now, you may be wondering, what's JP, the covenant? what's the Covenant? Oh, my goodness. It's I'm on top of it. It's a grouping oh of alien species in the galaxy uh, that hunt down forerunner artifacts to praise and continue on their great journey. Now, I know what you're asking. <laughs> I What's am. the great journey? <laughs> what does any of that mean? <laughs> you may be I wondering. I the games. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you may be wondering many things, uh, but one of them I want to talk about is Spartans. Now, the Spartans were started. I'm sorry. I am just overwhelmed with <laughs> Me too. appreciation and gratitude. <laughs> This is what happens this is what when happens. you give our sports reporter run time and say, JP, you can't talk about sports. Tell us about the Spartans, JP. Tell us about Spartans. So the Spartans were started as a special ops group of the greatest of humanity soldiers, one of which being Sergeant Johnson. You may remember him for his wonderful contributions to the first three games before he died. Spoiler alert for Halo 3's final mission of the campaign. Sergeant Johnson dies. Uh, they blow up Halo, the Covenant loses, and Master Chief and the Arbiter kiss. Um, and then at the end, uh, Master Chief goes off into the... You so anyway, like Alex the, Jones anyway, right the, <laughs> the first Spartans did not exactly really go well uh, as the adult human body is not equipped for genetic modification, but you know what is? Children. <laughs> so the UNSC went to orphans around the world, not just orphans, they stole children from families and replaced them with clones and wiped the memories of the parents so they would not know that their child is a clone. And so they brought the children to a special covert military base on the planet Reach, which we'll get to further down yeah, the that's, line. Uh, that's a game. That is a game. That it's a, a very game. good game. It's a great game. Uh, <laughs> I 
Uh, you so may be wondering. This on. Absolutely, you can. Uh, you this know, this is heavy. It is real metal. Um, I may or may not have gotten Keep it talking. from a real battlefield at Thermopylae. <laughs> Keep talking. Uh, but at the Planet Harvest was where first contact was made with the Covenant. Now we mentioned the Covenant, a group of alien species uh, that are all banded together in the united cause of going on this great journey that they think they can uh, ascend. <laughs> All of them. Let us shoot superheated plasma out of our starships and blow up their worlds and turn it into a sea of glass. So that's why that happened. And they showed up to harvest and started melting people with plasma. And, you know, humanity did not want to do that. They were like, that's stupid. We're not a fan of that. So they fought back. But turns out, just normal Marines, normal people like us here, you know, we have a Spartan here. Uh, this is for our purposes. Say you and I are, are Marines, Greek? Tyler. I'm Greek. No, at all. My ancestors are from Sparta. Let's go Greek people. A little further towards the coast, I'm Italian. I'm also fat. Three of the top five Mediterranean people of all time are sitting on this stage. Continue on. This is true. Uh, the Byzantine is the real empire. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so in our scenario here, you and I are just regular Marines, soldiers, and we are supposed to fight these aliens. Now, of course, these aliens are like 10 feet tall and giant warrior samurais from a planet known as St. Helios for the most part. But that's something that we'll get to later <laughs> in this Is there enough time for later? <laughs> <laughs> I will say that we'll get to it later with almost every topic. Of course, we, you know, we'll also get to later, you know, the actual real life Spartans. JP, there's not nearly the enough movie. time. JP, we have you booked for eight minutes. A great movie, <laughs> yeah, you know. let you talk about sports. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah. Um, you don't want to be melted? <laughs> no. Oh. A lot of the people in the last episode liked me in the comments. Uh, I have a feeling they won't like me. They said I needed to be They'll nerfed by you, God. <laughs> well, if you think about it, being melted is a form of being nerfed. <laughs> Your like, life powers are nerfed. By the mods. Well, that's God. like fifty percent less life power if you like zap well, off. Well, they like said 50%. nerf. They didn't, it's like Blackbeard being nerfed in Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah, they yeah. completely wanna, made him useless. If you want to hit like one of these, like Emperor Palpatine, yeah. I can totally edit in lightning mm -hmm. in the in post. Hmm. Yeah. If if you ever get the urge to melt me, and then we'll just end the segment right there. Oh, okay. And can that be like soon? Because. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I, I do have a tendency to ramble. I've been told this by many people, and it really makes me think of uh, Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> have you ever seen the Star Wars: The Clone Wars animated movie? I have. Oh man, now that's something I could talk about for a very long time. I, I don't know if we have enough time for that. Um, Anyway, it has been such a pleasure to join in y'all on this been, journey. Uh, well, Why did you get more southern? <laughs> it's a genetic condition, much like the genetically modified child soldiers we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, uh, thank you very much, JP. Scott. This past Tuesday, many of our own have traveled to Russell Underground for a night of comedy. And now we Unlimited. get to share just a bit of it How with you. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I present, present to you one, one of our fellow, fellow late shows, Carolina, Carolina Tonight. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, detective. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Sorry I'm late. I was uh, investigating a double homicide of a married couple. That sounds awful. What happened? Well, the wife killed her husband for making her watch too many Andrew Tate videos. I know. Poor woman. I know. Wait, you said double homicide? Indeed. How'd she die? Well, we don't know. You see, she turned herself in at the crime scene, but before we could get her confession, she died, mysteriously. So... You asked me, she couldn't live without a woman. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really f***ed up.
that's the one thing. I said the line wrong. Thing. She couldn't live without a man. <laughs> <laughs> that's awful. I know, it's awful that two people died. Anyways, tell me what happened here. Well, detective, mother gets home about an hour ago, finds her son shot and stabbed. Well, we've been combing through this place, but so far, no trace of where the killer may have went, nor what they could have used, nor motive, for that matter. Fascinating. Sounds like a real keeper. Let me get to have my magnifying glass. Let's get to work, shall we? Either the way, detective. <laughs> Excuse me! Are you the victim's mother? Yes. Do you know who did it? No. Bollocks! <laughs> I thought that would work. Well, my dear Donut Muncher, it seems this is unsolvable. So I bid you adieu. Unsolvable? Detective, shouldn't we, I don't know, look around for clues? What do I look like? Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Wait! I have an idea. What if we search for clues? <laughs> Wait, take <laughs> This looks to be the knife that the killer used to stab the victim. No, it looks to be like someone had toast and they needed to spread their strawberry jam. <laughs> so, get that out of here. Now! <laughs> 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 Look at this. This, this, my dear good sir, appears to be a piece to the puzzle. How? Hmm. <coughs> and this chewed up piece of gum tastes like murder. <coughs> I'm sorry, that was mine. I. I saw my son dead on the ground and I screamed and the, and the gum fell out onto the floor. You liar! Ah! He's lying. I know it. What's that? What is it? Underneath the chair. Where? Under the chair? Oh. This has to be the gun. Okay. <laughs> This is impossible. A killer would never just leave his murder weapon at the scene of the crime. Here, let me prove it to you. <laughs> Did that hurt, my dear lady? I'll take her silence as a no. I told you, it's just a fake. It's trying to get you on the killer's set. Well, was that note there before? I don't know. You got here first. <laughs> Okay, well, what does it say? Detective, it's a confession from the killer. Oh, please, what? As if, what does it say? <laughs> Whom it may concern, yeah, I killed Jimmy, and I do it again. It's what he gets for stealing my lunch money 15 years ago when we were in the fifth grade. Oh, please, a killer would never leave a note saying what his motive is at the scene of the crime. Next, you're gonna say he signed it with his name and his social security number. Loves and kisses, Mike from the fifth grade, six five six three seven four one five six. You know, could, could could I just see this note for a second? Could I just this is impossible. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm addicted to eating paper. Um I need you to stop obstructing justice, my good son. And let me get back to this case, because... You're really fucking it up, buddy. Just let me get back to this case. <laughs> What'd you do this for? For obstructing justice. <laughs> now, I think she knows more than she's been letting on. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <gasps> she's dead! Good heavens! Well, it's another double homicide. <laughs> no, it's not a double, another double homicide. You shot her oh, earlier with the... Please, look, she's got the gun wound right there and the stab wound. She died just like her son. Which means whoever killed her son killed her too. And since it only just happened recently, it must mean the killer is in this very room. <laughs> Where could he be? It was you! You did it! You're with me, 
right? <laughs> no, I most certainly am not. It wasn't me that killed her. It was you. No, it was definitely you. I'm a detective. I solve crimes, not commit them. <laughs> Except for the tax fraud one time. But that doesn't count. It was you. It had to have been. Now, imagine if the if anybody walked onto the scene of the crime Excuse right me. now. Hi. Um, so I killed that bastard, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> and I left a note, and I was kind of planning on getting arrested this afternoon, and it's kind of been a while, so uh, can you get on with it, please? Are you Mike? Yeah. This is impossible! Now, please, good sir, save it before this policeman kills another innocent man in the name of self-defense. <laughs> oh, get out! <laughs> Welcome back to Weird History. Joining me now once again this week is Caroline Smith, our current history <laughs> master, as well as our very own Grace Wisemantle, um, where they will be competing for the ever-coveted History Mastered Cup, now filled with jelly beans as it. a prize. Go, those, now, are, those are good looking jelly beans. They are, they, and they taste good too because I saw Caroline eat one off screen. I'm the history um, master, I deserve yeah, okay, it from I last you, week. I premature, guess you premature. Uh, from but, last week <laughs> until- You can't um, eat them now. <laughs> they're from last week. They're from, they're from last week, I guess. <laughs> so much like last time, I have five history questions where I will read the question. I will read the multiple choice answers. You will both get, so if you both get right, you both get a point up until the point we get to the tie for the last question, blah, 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 whatever, you get the point. That said, uh, there was a ruling error last time, but I will make sure not to do that. Uh, tonight, for you, I have a tale of French fan fiction, I guess it's more of a romance novel, and some weird stuff in Switzerland. But let's get into it. Are you two ready to begin? Yes. I guess. Our first question. Clisson and Eugène is a romantic novella written by a very notable historical figure. They wrote the novella in 1795, and it is widely acknowledged as being a fictional, fictionalized account of the doomed romance of a soldier and their lover, which paralleled the writer's own relationship with Eugène Desiree Clary. The synopsis is as follows. Clisson, a valiant French revolutionary soldier, finds solace in Eugénie's company at a public bath. He then decides to retire from the military and settles with Eugène where they raise their children. However, the war eventually resurfaces and Clisson feels an obligation to serve his country once again. Tragically, he is wounded in battle and his comrade Burville is entrusted to send the news to Eugène. Instead, seduces her and ceases sending Clisson letters. Devastated by his wife's infidelity, Clisson writes a final letter to Eugène and her lover before deliberately sacrificing his life in a front of a charge towards the enemy. Now, four options here. A, George Washington. Wait, what's the question? Uh, who wrote this? Okay. Sorry, I apologize. Wait, wait uh, who wrote this? is fan fiction? No, this is a romantic novella written by a historical figure. Okay. So fan fiction. Yeah, it's fan fiction. A little bit. Uh... Napoleon Bonaparte, B, C, Maximilian Robespierre, or D, Voltaire. <laughs> take your time, take your time. I'm going Voltaire. Okay. Napoleon. All right. The answer is, Clisson and Eugène is a romantic novella written by the great tactician Napoleon Bonaparte when he was a yeah! whopping Go 27 on. years old. He was His a freaky lover, guy. I knew he was, he was a freaky guy. I knew he was into that. But so was Voltaire, <laughs> so I didn't know what to pick. Uh, his lover and fiance, Bernadine Eugène Desiree Clary, was queen of Sweden and Norway from the 5th of February, 1818, to the 8th of March, 1844. As the wife of King Charles, John the 14th, Charles John was a former French general and founder of the House of Bernadette. Well, so one point, Grace, you All are right. in the lead. All right, question number two. Murad IV, born in Constantinople, was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire from 1623 to 1640. Known for restoring the state's authority, but more importantly for this question, the brutality of his methods. Maybe his methods were so brutal because he was brought to power by a palace conspiracy when he was just 11 years old, when he succeeded his uncle Mustafa I. During his reign, Murad IV banned alcohol, tobacco, and coffee in Constantinople. 
If one broke this policy, he ordered their execution. However, this did not keep many people at bay. Around how many people did Murad order the death of for smoking tobacco? A, 12,000. B, 12,500. C, 17,000. Or D, 25,000. Got some variety here. Yeah. Some excellent choices. I like the, the prices writing that's happening in mm -hmm. like the first two mm -hmm. answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Answer. I'm going to go with 12,000. 12,000. 12,500. 12,500. I'll price is right, yeah. <laughs> As per a comment I found on Twitter, strangely, smoking did little good in increasing the life expectancy of around 25,000 people. Though this number should come as no surprise, considering he also once strangled a grand vizier after they had beaten his mother-in-law. So uh, don't mess with his in-laws, I That's so many people. That is 25,000. That is so many people. people. Listen, 12,000 is too many people. And this was back in like the 1600s, so there weren't that wow. many people. That's like a third of the Ottoman Empire's population. Yeah. I don't um, know what their how population they, Wait, how were they, they the getting time? killed? Uh, they oh. were just executed. He just ordered their execution if oh. they were caught smoking tobacco. This was specifically for tobacco. Keep in mind, he also banned alcohol and coffee in Constantinople. Oh, he wouldn't stand a chance in coffee in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. was even to a chance. We'd be dead. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is a little bit of a different question than we've had on the show before. Um, and is more so of a vocabulary question. Oh, Our language is one that is influenced by many cultures and countries from around the globe, some of which you may not have even realized or given thought to where they originated. One of those words is gymnasium, and it is derived from a few components. Generally, it's a little unclear as to what the word is from specifically, but most sources I found agree is from the adjective gymnos and by way of a related verb, gymnazo. What does the word gymnazo roughly translate to? A, to train hard. B, to train as gods. C, to train naked. Or D, to train loving. What was the original language? Uh, Greek. Okay. That's a good variety. To train naked. Train naked? I'm also gonna say to train naked. To train naked. The word gymnastics derives from the common Greek adjective gymnos, meaning naked, by way of related verb mm. gymnazo, who is meaning to train naked. That is a point for both of our contestants. Current right. score is one, Caroline, and two, Grace. I believe that is going to take us to the next page. Back to France. Henry III was king of France from 1574 until his assassination in 1589 as well as King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania from 1573 to 1575. France at the time was plagued by wars of religion, as Europe often is, and his authority was undermined by violent political factions. Unfortunately, but not uncharacteristically, by foreign powers. Henry III himself was a politique, which essentially means that he thought a religiously tolerant monarchy would save France from collapse. This would eventually result in a succession crisis but that's not weird history, for Europe at least. Today, we are far more concerned by his little obsession. What was King Henry III's weird obsession? Playing cup and ball, playing beanbag toss, juggling, or fingerboarding? What is fingerboarding? Fingerboarding, by modern equivalents, it is like tech decks. Um, so, sort of a... 1500s version of that would be sort of the best answer I can describe given the time we have. Can you repeat the, the answer choices? A, cup and ball. B, beanbag toss. C, juggling. Or D, fingerboarding. You gonna act that one out? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to I don't know act out. <laughs> oh, like skateboards. Yes, like skateboards. Oh, like okay. skateboards. That. That? Okay. I'm gonna say juggling. Juggling. That's kind of sick. Juggling, <laughs> juggling calls to me. I don't know. It calls to. Okay. Yeah. King Henry III of France loved cup and ball so much wow, that he it. set up cup schools to teach people how to play, though his playing was considered evidence of his mental instability. Yeah. After his death, the game went out of fashion, 
though the game was very popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. Jean-Jacques Rousseau mentions the game early in his confessions Not when Rousseau. stating his Confession. reservations about idle talk and hands, saying, if I ever went back to into society, I should carry a cup and ball in my pocket <laughs> and play with it all day long to excuse myself from speaking when I have nothing to say. You just had anxiety. Yeah, he just needed a cell phone. He just needed he just, a, a little thing. He just needed to pop. back out. I was yeah. just I left the room, go take my cup of ball, and just go live, just go, a little go, moment, go live your life. Man. Just yeah. a little moment by myself with my Sitting cup in a corner, and my ball. Just like uh, mentally recharge. Yeah. Mentally recharge. Sit down. Just take a moment. Take a moment. And for our last question, this is also a little different of a format. Uh, a little mini game that I will call "What is even happening in this picture?" I have an image printed out for you to look at or hold. I'm going to hand it to you individually, where you will have ten Mississippi to look at it, and then it will be passed to the next contestant. From there, I will take the image back. Whoever can best explain what is going on, where is going on, or when is going on, will receive the final point of the game. Now, I will say because the printer is iffy. Is on this page, so I'm going to hand contestant one, Caroline, the oh picture. Gosh, You're going to have ten first. Mississippi to look at it. All right. <laughs> That's the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Okay, I'm on five. Okay. All right, ten Mississippi. Please pass it to Grace. That is, that is 10 Mississippi. All right, so as I said, this question is a little bit different. Does anyone have any idea what is going on, where this may be, or when this may be? I think that's industrial revolution period. It's like, it's a power line center. Okay. It's like, a, it's the, the, like all those things, like all the beams shooting out of the building. Those are like electricity. I'm so sorry. Those are that's what the beams are doing to you. Mm -hmm. They're all they're power lines. There is also a hint for this question. I should say. So if you would like the hint, I can give it to you. I'm having a great time on my own right okay. now. Okay. I think they're they're power lines. Okay. So this is like when electricity is starting. I don't know. I don't know when that is. Let's call it like 1880s. Okay. Roughly where New York City. Okay. All right. All right, Grace, do you have any ideas where this may be? <laughs> I, was, I was getting kind of like an in, 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 industrial revolution vibe, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I was thinking like London. Okay. And Grace just went to London <laughs> and she was changed. She's <laughs> that girl with the London I for you had a little bit of a British accent when you were out here. <laughs> It all makes sense now. It looks, I don't know, it looks like one of the big fancy bridges that they got going on. And uh, it looks, this looks like a really sketchy way of construction and architecture. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't, it gives bad vibes. Okay. That's a fire this is This is very, so, it's very unstable. To lock in our answers, what? What is going on? You said? I said it was power cables. Power cables. Electricity cables. I see, I see sketchy construction. Sketchy construction. Okay. Where is this happening? I said New York City. So okay. London. Okay. When is this happening? Industrial, Industrial Revolution. Revolution. All right. This is a telephone tower in Stockholm, Sweden. Long before they figured out the whole network changing thing, uh, there is a total of about 5,000 lines, and this image was captured in 1890. Now, if I don't believe, Caroline, you were closer on what was going on, you were closer on where was going on, and you both were very similar on when is going on. That means that I will give you both a point, meaning that I think Grace is our history oh! master! Congratulations, oh. Grace. You all now have the yeah! Of the history master. Heck yeah. Thank Chubbies. you all for playing. They're it is Chubbies. yours until next week, where hopefully you will come back to rejoin us. Go ahead, eat it right now. It's really <laughs> clattery. Uh, I think that's all I got for you guys this week. However, I think Tyler has one more Florida Man shout out for you guys. So thank you all very much for watching this little segment. 
and I'll see you next time. Tyler, back to you. Nice memes, though. That's right, Sam. Tonight's edition of the Florida Man of the Week features a report from CBS 47 and Fox 30 Action News Jax. The headline reads, Florida man accused of using Kool-Aid packets to steal nearly $1,000 in Walmart merchandise. The story was published nearly two years ago on October 19th in the year of our Lord, 2020. Our protagonist is 37-year-old Bradley Young of North Naples, who hid water-flavoring packets in his hand while scanning various expensive items. These items included a $284 scooter, around $160 worth of batteries, God knows why, and other high-priced goods. Young used the 24-cent flavoring packets at checkout rather than the items, hiding them in his hands while, scan while sneaking the valuables across the self-checkout belt after the substitute scanning, pulling a little bit of a 3,000-level uh, sleight of hand move, scanning the 24-cent, boom. Uh, yeah, $994 worth of merchandise rang up to only $24.44. That's a great deal. He must have had a card or something. But a loss prevention worker at the Walmart noticed the incident and reported Young to the authorities, leading to charges of grand theft and shoplifting for our Floridian felon. Now I have my beautiful, as always, co-host, Yellow Sweater. What do you think about that one, Mr. Yellow? You know, Florida continually proves that no matter the day and age, even in 2020, they can make us laugh with things such as using Kool-Aid packets to commit uh, grand theft. I'm from Florida. Do you think I'm funny? I think you're very funner, uh, funny, Mr. Blue Sweater. <laughs> now that about wraps things up for this week's edition of the Carolina Late Show. Let's give myself and Sam some alone time. For more SGTV content, please be sure to check out the other videos on our YouTube channel and subscribe for weekly uploads. From all of us here in the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio, have a great night, Carolina, forever to thee.